Good evening and welcome to another McLean's Live. I'm Paul Wells. I'm the uh, senior writer here at McLean's Magazine. I'm speaking to you from Ottawa. And um, as always, before we start one of these uh, sessions, I want to thank our sponsors at the Canadian Bankers Association. And for more than two years, I've been making these conversations uh, available uh, to everybody, and uh, we're always grateful for that. And thanks also to you for watching at home. Um, last night, Tuesday, Mar uh, November 3rd, was a, a major political event that was followed by people all over the world. Uh, of course, it, was, uh, uh, it marked a month since Annemi Paul became the new leader of the Green Party of Canada. And here to help us celebrate is Annemi Paul. Thanks for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Paul. Thanks for having me. Um, there was also the business of an election in the United States last night. I don't know if you followed any of that and what, 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 what uh, observations you have from that uh, uh, extended unpleasantness. Well, going into it, uh, we knew it was going to, I, at least I, I felt that it was going to be close and that we probably wouldn't know the result. Uh, that being said, I did stay up until 1 a.m. and then woke up at 4 a.m. Uh, to see how it was progressing. My older son was born in the States so while I was in graduate school. And so as an American, he's particularly keen on knowing the results. So we're watching it very closely. Um, let's get into, I guess, the, the, the sort of main reason for having you here. This is the first time in 14 years that the Green Party has a new leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, I guess a, a new chance to reintroduce itself to Canadian voters. Uh, you won. Uh, uh, the, the leadership in a fairly crowded field of candidates uh, at the beginning of October. You've already run in a by-election in Toronto Centre where you weren't elected, uh, but you sure got noticed. Um, what, what can you tell us, or what, what, what are your thoughts on this moment for the Green Party of Canada in general? Well, as you said, this is the first time in 14 years that we have had a new leader, and that is always a moment of of uh, transformation, of renewal, and certainly in my case, what I was hoping for the most is that it would be an opportunity to have a new conversation with people in Canada. I really am hoping that they're going to look at us again. Uh, and uh, that seems to be going well. You know, I've been doing that for a month now, just having lots of conversations uh, with uh, people all across Canada. And they are definitely definitely interested in hearing about um, this new direction for the Green Party and, and our plans, especially leading into the, the next election. Um, you, uh, you spent like 20 years, it seems to me, reading your bio, working very general in the field of, field of political leadership. You founded an institution for political leadership. Um, have you consciously been uh, building towards uh, a career in, in elected politics. Um, I, I wonder how one prepares for the kind of position you find yourself in now. Uh, it, so the quick answer is no. <laughs> um, but what I did have, what I've always had from a very young age, is a real appreciation of the, the work that is done uh, within government and the role of the, you know, the various legislative um, bodies uh, across the country. I was a page when I was 12 and I think just having that experience very early made it very clear to me that important decisions were taken there and so um, that I've always had, that I've always had. In terms of what prepares you for this kind of role, I have to say just living. The other thing I took away from those early exposures to politics is that uh, it's really good to have a full life and to have worked in other places and, and you know, had a family and all the kind of things that people do when they're just living their lives uh, before getting into politics. Uh, having that lived experience is, is really important. And I think it helps you uh, to be a better public policymaker. Um, you worked on the leadership campaign of Gerard Kennedy when he was running for the Ontario Liberal leadership in the, in the 90s, is that correct? Uh, well, so I was an intern. Uh, the Canadian Political Science Association has an, um, offers a one-year internship program in the yeah. Ontario legislature. And so as part of that, I spent half of my time working for um, a conservative um, MPP and half of it working for a liberal MPP. And it just happened to be during the liberal leadership race. So I didn't work on, on his campaign per se, but uh, I was working for an MPP that was supporting him. Okay, uh, and, and you had a kind of a, a, a window into that whole process. Oh, mm -hmm. And 
96 was an interesting leadership race. It was the one where uh, Kennedy was one of the um, uh, considered quite likely to win and ended up not winning because Dalton McGinty came from pretty far behind to, uh, to, to be the surprise uh, winner of that leadership race. Um, what did you learn about the process of leadership selection in general in that, uh, in that year? Well, first you learn that anything can happen because you're absolutely right. Uh, Dalton McGinty was not at all favored to win that. And then when you're behind the scenes, you really see how much goes into it. You know, this is a real team effort. You have to have a lot of people that I wouldn't even say so much believe in the candidate, but believe in, in the a common vision or have a sense of common purpose. Um, that, that those were really the big, big takeaways uh, for me. And I, I, you know, it's interesting you mentioned it because I don't think I, I thought of that consciously uh, while I was running, but I definitely took those lessons away from that leadership race. Okay. Um, and after all of that, after, you know, pretty close um, uh, contact with progressive conservatives in Ontario, with Ontario liberals, you end up gravitating towards the Green Party of Canada. You've had various roles within the party, you know, for, for some time, even before you ran as a candidate in 2019. Why the, why the Green Party of Canada? Uh, when, um, when I came back to Canada after having worked for quite a number of years overseas, I finally uh, was able to join a party. You know, I didn't have any constraints around uh, the work that I was doing. And I, I did look at, uh, at the major parties in Canada. I tried to do it with fresh eyes. But for me, it was very clear very quickly that uh, the Green Party was, it was just going to be my, my political home. I wanted a party uh, where the power was distributed, where it wasn't strictly concentrated in the, in the person of the leader and their, their entourage. I wanted a party that was very serious about the climate emergency and proposing a real plan. Uh, and I also felt that the Green Party was by far the most innovative uh, of all of the parties, that they were still willing to propose really bold public policy. And given the, you know, just the unprecedented challenges that we're facing, that's exactly what is needed. And I, I just didn't see it in, in the other parties. Um, it was also a party that spent um, the entirety of Elizabeth May's tenure as leader winning in single digits in federal elections in terms of popular vote. Uh, and and um, uh, having a very difficult time breaking through electorally. Um, why do you suppose that was? Well, you know, again, it, it always sounds self-serving when we say it, but there is no question that the first past the post system always disadvantages small parties. Uh, we actually have the most uh, seats uh, in any national assembly of any country that has a first past the post system. Uh, and then, you know, we were founded in the 80s. It takes a certain amount of time for people to get to know a, a political party and Elizabeth uh, and the party did a great job over the last 14 years helping people to get to know us, but that's, that work is, is still ongoing. Uh, unfortunately, in politics in Canada, and again, it's something that attracted me to the Green Party as opposed to the other ones, uh, there has been a lot of success in creating political campaigns around encouraging people to vote against something as opposed to for something. Uh, we have a very high strategic uh, voting um, let's say impetus in this country. And so those are the things that have historically made it challenging for us to make any kind of uh, significant uh, breakthrough. But, you know, we're, we're, we, we're getting there. We're getting there. So what needs to change now for you to make uh, greater inroads? Is it the electoral system? Is it uh, Green Party policy? Is it message? Uh, is it the way folks like uh, me and the media treat you and the other parties? What's, what's got to give? I just want to say yes, 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 yes to everything, everything that you just said, because, you know, there, there, is, it, there is no um, magic formula. It's a mix of all of the things that you mentioned. Um, the one thing that I would add to all of that certainly is the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, you know, this is something that has transformed our society socially. And I don't think people fully understand yet uh, how much it has transformed our politics. I think we saw an inkling of that in the by-election that I just ran, where people uh, in a very short period of time uh, were willing, you know, a third of the residents in Toronto Centre were willing to make a choice they had never made before uh, by voting for, uh, for Greens, because I believe they clearly wanted a positive message. They clearly uh, wanted a change. Uh, and a lot of that definitely flowed out of the pandemic. So I believe that a lot of the circumstances 
that go into uh, breakthroughs for political parties like ours uh, exist at this moment. Um, so that was the by-election in Toronto Centre, which is very much downtown Toronto. You had run uh, in the general election in 2019, uh, and um, then you ran again uh, this past month, and you more than quadrupled your share of the popular vote. Yeah. Um, from seven to over 30%. Um, is, uh, is it, was that purely a result of, of, you know, being identified as the new leader or is that something that you think you can, uh, you can, um, uh, apply as a, as a, as a, as a base to grow in other writings? It's, you know, again, it's a combination. There is no question. I would never uh, suggest that the fact that I was the leader uh, wasn't a help, but really more than anything, I believe, you know, our slogan for the by-election was be daring. And uh, for people who are were really struggling, this is a riding where people are struggling with poverty and the opioid epidemic um, and affordability they were ready to choose something different. And I do believe that uh, this, the pandemic and the moment we're living through is so disruptive that the normal calculus that people put into uh, um, deciding how to vote has changed. Uh, they are going to be looking for a different way. And if, if a party like ours is proposing that better way, that better path, uh, I believe clearly the result from the by-election tells us that they are willing to take that leap and take that final last step that they've hesitated to take in the past. Okay. Um, meanwhile, you've got a federal liberal government that, that is quite proud of its, of its environmentalist credentials, uh, that has promised to um, meet its 2030 emission targets on its way to um, uh, quite ambitious uh, net zero uh, carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, they've got a new environment minister. They talk about this stuff all the time. Surely, uh, as the leader of the Green Party, you're very impressed by the liberal efforts. I feel like you know what my answer is going to be. On the <laughs> I, thought I, I thought I'd tee you up anyway. <laughs> that's that's the, the setup, and I'll just hit that out. Um, I am not impressed. And uh, one of the reasons that uh, our caucus voted against, against uh, the speech from the throne is exactly because um, there was nothing new in there for the climate. We still have the same old targets that we've been told for years now are, are just simply not good enough. They're not going to get us uh, to reducing greenhouse gases uh, in the way that we need to. We don't have a proper plan. Uh, we don't have any vision to get us where we need to go. Uh, and so for the Green Party, that's always going to be a red line because we're in an urgent climate crisis. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing with the, the uh, Liberal government is really just smoke and mirrors. Uh, it's all great to have 2050 targets, but you need to have a plan to get from here to there, and they're not proposing one. So um, at this moment in time, I will say unequivocally that the only party that is proposing a true plan with real targets uh, to uh, attack the climate emergency. Um, and what's that plan? I mean... Those targets are ambitious. Elizabeth May always said they weren't close to being ambitious enough. So how would you make even, even more sweeping reductions in carbon emissions in a relatively short time before 2030? Well, when I was uh, running in the leadership race, I put out a document called Chance of a Lifetime. Uh, and it was about accelerating our transition to a climate neutral economy. And this really built on green policies, you know, I mean, I really want to underline that uh, my role as the leader of our party is really to amplify the messages and the policies that our members have developed. Uh, so in, you know, what I talked about there and what we'll be talking about in the days and weeks and months to come is how uh, we can take the money that we will inevitably be spending uh, to stimulate our economy as we exit uh, from the pandemic uh, as wisely as possible to invest in the, the infrastructure, uh, in the sectors, uh, in the retrofits, all of the things that we need uh, to you know, create the solid foundation for a green economy and to accelerate our, um, our uh, movement towards a climate neutral economy. This is entirely doable. The European Union has already gone far down the road in terms of their planning towards this. Uh, we just need the political leadership uh, to get us there, but we have all of the elements that we need to do it. Okay. Uh, it sounds like 
um, emphasizing investment uh, to, to, to get most of those um, reductions. Is there room for a stiffer green tax, a carbon tax? So some of the elements that we, you know, we've seen, again, not just here, but uh, globally, that there's a consensus around uh, in terms of getting us to that climate neutral economy are things like um, a carbon tax, a car you know, carbon tax and rebate. Uh, and we want to see that being increased uh, at increments until we get to the, the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, but that should be combined with other things. Uh, I talked about uh, during the leadership race, and this is not yet Green Party policy, but I think our members would be supportive of uh, carbon border adjustments, or sometimes we call them a carbon tariff. Uh, and then we have one of the most exciting clean tech uh, sectors, burgeoning clean tech sectors in the world. This is a sector that is estimated to be worth um, three trillion by 2030, and uh, this is those are the kind of investments we should be looking at uh, at making. So it's it's really not just one thing, but it's uh, it's a combination of of elements. And uh, you know, when taken together, they can get us to 60% reductions by 2030, and that should be the goal. Okay. Carbon border adjustment essentially uh, implies levying um, uh, a, a surcharge on imports from countries that aren't pulling their weight on, on, uh, on uh, emission reductions. That would almost certainly include uh, higher tariffs on goods from the United States, which is our principal trading partner, wouldn't it? Well, not, not necessarily. Again, we're, we're watching the, the outcomes now in the United States carefully. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but Joe Biden uh, has been very clear that he is very interested in bringing in a carbon border tariff uh, for the United States. Um, the European Union is, I believe, it's, it's two phases into a three-phase process of implementing their own uh, carbon border. Uh, so, you know, Canada has the option of being left behind and having two of its, uh, of its main trading partners um, imposing these and therefore imposing them on our businesses, or we can get ahead of it and uh, bring in our own, keep the money at home, protect Canadian businesses, while at the same time incentivizing other countries uh, to increase their targets. Um you spend a lot of time uh, overseas. You, you worked in Brussels, uh, the Canadian mission to the European Union. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and you were the foreign affairs critic uh, for the party under uh, Ms. May. Um, people don't usually think of the Green Party in relation to global affairs. Uh, what sort of changes would you, would you advocate for Canadian foreign policy? So the, the theme, Paul, for me as the new leader is, is you know, it's look again, uh, because uh, if people do look again, they will see that we have been very, certainly when I was the critic, but even prior to me, we have been, we, we follow these issues, we put out statements, um, you know, you're absolutely right that it's not what we're best known for, but it's something that we have always really put a lot of effort into, um, uh, you know, speaking out about, and we continue to do that. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, uh, you know, we, we have uh, our core values and some of them impact our, our approach to foreign policy. Nonviolence is one of those things. And so, you know, at the moment, for instance, uh, you know, we, we are expressing our disappointment in Canada's uh, non-participation non, um, in the uh, nuclear non-proliferation um, uh, agreements. Uh, we like to, we want to see multilateralism reinforced. This is a time of global challenges. Not one single um, big challenge can be addressed uh, simply at the national level. And so um, when we see our multilateral uh, institutions under attack, we want to see Canada um, supporting them. And then, you know, Canada has lost a lot of its standing in the world. I know this from my personal experience uh, working in diplomacy um, over the last number of years. Uh, we need to return to the basics. We need to find the things that we do well, build coalitions around those things, uh, and, uh, and, and demonstrate leadership. And it's a it's very simple formula, but we've strayed from it, and it's been at the cost of our international standing. Okay. How do you square nonviolence with one of the central multilateral engagements that Canada has, which is its um, membership in NATO? Well, you know, Canada is a, uh, a middling country. You know, we're an important country, but a middling one. And when I talk about uh, multilateralism, I, I'm really, I'll extend that to alliances. 
Canada, uh, in general, will be more impactful, have mu much more of an opportunity for positive impact if it's in the room than if, um, if it's um, outside of the room. And so when we look at our alliances, whether it's NATO or, or other alliances, uh, that's really the, the lens that we look at them through. They need to be constantly reassessed. We need to make sure that, they, um, that they're coherent with Canadian values and principles. Uh, but wherever possible, uh, we should be um, considering how we can um, work within alliances to make sure that they reflect the values uh, that we talk about. Okay. Um, watching the Green Party over the last several uh, election cycles, it has often seemed to me that it didn't uh, always want to be a modern political party with, with uh, social media, uh, messaging, get out the vote, voter ID, ID operations, all the sort of um, uh, essentially technical work that uh, involves identifying your supporters and making sure that they know that they're supposed to vote for you. Um, uh, is that blatantly unfair or is that, um, it's, I, I wrote when Elizabeth May announced that she was going to leave the leadership that this was a field of real opportunity for, uh, a new leader who wanted to drag the party into the 21st century. What, what sort of work are you uh, doing on, the, on those fronts? Well, if you look at our, bio, well, first, um, our leadership race and our campaign, uh, part of it, of course, uh, you know, it was just a necessity because of the pandemic and not being able to travel. It was a very sophisticated, high-tech campaign. Um, we had a lot of engineers and mathematicians working on our campaign and social media um, and digital, digital campaigners. Uh, in terms of the by-election, I would really defy anyone, Paul, I would challenge anyone to, to find a, a by-election campaign that was more sophisticated than the one that we ran. I mean, all of the things that you describe, all of the, the tools at you know, disposal for doing modern campaigning were all deployed and you saw that in the results. So it's, not some, it's something that I'm very comfortable with. It's something that I have spent the last nine months uh, working with, and uh, certainly we've been, you know, we've we've uh, we've we've been able to pull together a team that is really keen to use all of those technologies to make us as competitive as possible in the next election. Okay, because uh, whatever else their merits or or points that you can criticize, the Liberal Party under Justin Trudeau brings a ferocious ground game to their mm -hmm. campaigns, and um, don't I know it? <laughs> <laughs> Did, have you met Marcy Ian, the new MP for Toronto Centre? Have you met her before? Very briefly. We just crossed paths. Actually, both of us, we were in the riding uh, campaigning. But, uh, Paul, that was a real shock and awe campaign uh, in the last week or so. I mean, that was the entire Liberal apparatus that uh, dropped down into that riding to make sure that that seat uh, was secured. And it is impressive. There is no question. And uh, if we're going to be competitive, and I want to be, because I want there to be more Greens elected. We are a political party. We're there to win seats. We're there to have the biggest voice that we can um, in Parliament. And so if we're going to be competitive, we have got to make sure that we're continuously at the cutting edge. Uh, and that's something we're very proud of. We want to be the party of innovation. And so this has to be one of those areas. And I, I think um, that, that we demonstrated that in the by-election. I mean, we, we did a really excellent job in demonstrating that uh, you know, that, that, let's say that orientation. Okay. Uh, un until the great day comes when Canada finally enters a, a new era of electoral reform, and I'm not sure when that's going to happen, uh, we do have a first past the post system, which means you have to find some posts that you think you can get past first. What, where regionally is the Green Party going to be uh, concentrating its effort? I want us to be competitive everywhere. And uh, I also know that we need to grow our party be beyond its traditional bases out in British Columbia and the Atlantic provinces. We've done tremendous work in those places and there's still more that we can do. You know, we certainly uh, should be looking to win more seats in both of those places. I think that one of the things that's really exciting about, uh, about the members having chosen me as the leader is that they knew I came from a different part of the country. You know, I'm from, I'm from Ontario. Um, I'm in Toronto, and they were very excited about the possibilities of growing our base here. Uh, I speak French, and so I've made it. I've done a lot of interviews uh, with um, with uh, the francophone press. I've made it really clear that Quebec is also somewhere that we have in our sights. 
There are a lot of progressive people there who just don't see themselves represented in the Bloc or the other federal parties. So um, I'm looking everywhere. And then the prairies, you know, the prairies as well. The prairies need the Green Party most of all because we're talking about the kind of economic diversification that is going to allow communities to remain in place, um, that is going to create the jobs of the future, um, and that is going to replace uh, an industry that uh, is uh, in an irreversible decline. Okay. Do you have any sense of when the election is going to be and, and, and what do you need to have ready by the time there's a, an election called? I was actually going to look behind me for the crystal ball that I, <laughs> <laughs> because, um, listen, if you, if I knew that, um, I would actually, might, I might consider a different line of work because I know there are a lot of people that pay good money for that information. I don't, I do not know. I, what I do, what I do know is that this parliament uh, seems to be headed uh, towards a collision course uh, to an early election. Um, what we've seen over the last number of weeks is this just the steady decline in the kind of cross-partisan spirit that allowed us to weather the first um, months of the pandemic well. Uh, I see a lot of, of um, politi political uh, jockeying, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, parties seeking electoral advantage, and all of these things to me are you know, precursors to, to an early election. So I hope that that's not the case because nothing has changed. We're in the second wave of a pandemic. Uh, we still have urgent business that we need to do on behalf of people in Canada. I don't think that they will actually forgive us or forgive the institution if we plunge them into an election during a pandemic. Um, but you know, if that's going to happen, if that's not going to happen, then we really need to see some of these political games uh, coming to an end. Okay. Do you feel like you need to get into the House of Commons before the next election? Well, when's the next election, Paul? I mean, this is the question, you know, I mean, if, if we were in, if we were, if we were in a majority uh, situation, um, then we could plan, uh, we could say, well, we're going to look to the next by election, we're going to wait until the next election, but we could be in an election at any point. So um, I'm going to need to be ready to run uh, wherever is best uh, for me to run uh, as soon as possible. And uh, now that the by-election is over, those are the conversations that I'm having. Actually, later today, I'll be talking with, uh, with some uh, members of our team about that. I'll be talking with our leadership later, with the members. Uh, so there's a lot I can do outside of Parliament. I think it's really important to remember examples like Jack Layton um, and others who were elected before they had a seat. And they did a lot of important uh, groundwork and building of the base and, and all of that before entering Parliament. And that was critical. Uh, so I can do a lot outside of Parliament. I know that there are things that I'm missing out on not being in Parliament, uh, but there's trade-offs either way. So we'll, um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, your competition is not only the Liberals, it is the other parties that are seen as progressive that um, uh, are, need, frankly, green voters uh, to not vote green. They, they, they need them to vote NDP or Bloc uh, instead. Uh, is, it, is the opposition of the Liberals getting a little crowded and is that one of the problems that you're facing? In the by-election that, um, that I just contested, we were the only party to gain. The Liberals dropped 15%, the NDP dropped, I think it was five to 7%. The Conservatives dropped um, half of their vote, about 6% of their vote. And uh, we, on the other hand, gained um, about 27%. Uh, so, you know, we, we are clearly capable of attracting interest from people who traditionally vote for the other parties. Um, I think that they're seeing what I have described, which is that in this, this moment where we really need new ideas, we need innovative ideas, and we need a political party that is going to be quite fearless about um, putting those ideas out there they're not seeing that uh, in the, either the Liberals or in their junior partner, uh, the NDP. And uh, what, they really, what they're really looking for is a true alternative progressive option, and that's us. We, we occupy a space that uh, really no one else occupies in politics, and the, the pandemic has made that clearer and clearer to people. Okay. Historically, support for uh, um, strong policy positions on uh, climate issues has tracked pretty closely with economic prosperity. There's a sense that when things are going well, people can afford to be green. 
And uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a year like 2020, uh, you might face uh, the opposite perception, which is that we have income maintenance crises, we have a public health crisis, we have uh, potentially a public debt crisis, and uh, maybe we can all just be green a little later because we've got some, some press, pressing issues here. Um, is it a tough time to be advocating green policy? Not at all, because we understand. First, I believe that people understand more than ever how interconnected things are. Uh, that uh, decisions that are taken half a world away impact us here. Um, that there are things that uh, there are things that we are deci we decide now uh, that we're going to have to live with for a long time. The pandemic has really made that very clear to people. Um, there is no question that in this moment of urgent needs. Uh, people are really focused on those. There is no question about that. And that, that's as it should be. Uh, what we need at a time like this is political leadership. Uh, because what a pol you know, all the, the information that the Green Party has is the same information that all the political parties have, which is that uh, even in the midst of this pandemic, the climate emergency has worsened. Uh, the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere have worsened. Uh, and so we can't afford to put this off. We can't afford to press the pause button. And so um, true leadership at this time would first be letting people in Canada know that we, you know, that, that, that they can't forget this and also that they're taking care of it. Um, there's nothing stopping the Liberal government from setting a, a proper target that corresponds to the science and putting in place a green plan. They had the opportunity to do that in the speech from the throne and it was clear it was clear that people were hoping and expecting that. Um, and they passed aside because they were focused on short-term um, political gain. And that is a huge, huge missed opportunity on behalf of people in Canada. Okay, 60% reduction by 2030 is, uh, I mean, I haven't done the math off the top of my head, but it's, it's many megatons in further reductions beyond what the Liberals have targeted. Um, you're just always going to get asked, is that at all compatible with uh, economic growth and recovery? Absolutely. And, and you know, with, in that respect, I will tell you that um, this, is a, this is a global consensus. Whether you're talking about central banks, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, whether it's Mark Carney, our former, uh, former governor of the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, whether it's BlackRock, and we could just go on and on. The, the, the possibility of a green recovery and the acceleration of our transition towards a climate neutral economy uh, is considered to be the greatest economic opportunity of our lifetime, which is why I called it the chance of a lifetime. Uh, this is the, the, um, the direction that we want to head in if we're looking to secure our economic future, create the jobs of the future, um, and at the same time, of course, uh, reduce greenhouse gases. And so this is just a win, win, win. And again, it's the reason why I'm, I'm confused about the lack of political leadership on this issue. You can go out to Alberta and say, yes, those jobs, um, those fossil fuel jobs are in decline, but here's a job that pays more, that pays more, that lets you go home every single night, that you don't have to retrain for, um, that you can take on day one. Why wouldn't you want to sell that, not sell, but share that good news with uh, people out on the prairies? The only answer, in, in my opinion, is that you're thinking simply about um, the next election cycle, nothing more. Um, and it's just easier, again, to, to kick that can down the road. Um, it often seems that there's a bit of a time delay between the prospect of the job and the job showing up. Uh, I mean, the, the, the jobs that you're describing for Alberta um, workers in the oil patch, can they have that job tomorrow? They can indeed. They can indeed. And if we look to the United States, you know, people think simply of the, you know, the presidential or the national level. But if you look at the states that have begun their transition toward a green economy, you know, these are jobs where half of the jobs are jobs that workers from the um, from the oil sector can take on day one without an elaborate retraining. Uh, the jobs pay up to 10 percent more. And um, you know, we know that for every million dollars that we invest in uh, green sector, uh, the green sector, that you produce eight jobs as compared to the three jobs you get for the same million in uh, the fossil fuel sector. So again, as I said, this, this is the chance of a lifetime. We have the money because we're going to be spending hundreds of billions of dollars to get our economy going uh, after the pandemic. 
Um, we have we have the you know the the collective consensus, the global consensus that this is the way to go. It's where all the smart money is going. All we need now is the political leadership uh, to take us there, and that is the missing piece right now. Okay. Well, um, we've covered a lot of ground. You've been admirably succinct in your answers, uh, and uh, I, I guess it, all that remains for you is to keep making your case to Canadians that you and the Green Party are that missing piece. In the meantime, I want to thank you, Anami Paul, for joining us and for sharing your thoughts with us uh, this evening. Oh, it's really been a pleasure. Hope, hope to get invited back soon, Paul. There's a very good chance of that. And uh, we also want to thank, of course, the Canadian Bankers Association, our sponsors, for all of these conversations here at McLean's Live. And thanks again to you folks at home for joining us. We'll see you again soon.